we are going to introduce Rebecca Carr. She is an occupational therapist in Pennsylvania at Bryn Mawr Rehabilitation Hospital. I had the pleasure of meeting her in another support group I occasionally attend at Bryn Mawr, and she's going to present to us today a presentation on smart homes. Um, Rebecca, go ahead. Thank you, Amy. Um, like I said, I'm an OT at Bryn Mawr Rehab, um, and I primarily work in um, our outpatient setting. And let me just share my screen really quickly. Um, I work in an outpatient setting with patients with neurological um, disabilities or dysfunction. And um, I really started to begin, um, let me get this, Oops. I began um, working a lot with smart home because I had a, a patient who was a spinal cord injury who was a pretty high cervical level, level um, complete injury. And he was very motivated to utilize technology to be able to control things in his home. So we kind of began to learn together a little bit. And that's kind of what inspired me to start to talk about this um, with either support groups or in patient and one-on-one -on -one settings. So we're just going to kind of go over um, a brief update on what smart home technology is uh, and what is out there and what's available. So our, my first objectives are just being able to understand the basic requirements for a smart home um, setup. A lot of people get pretty nervous or uncomfortable with initially um, introducing something like that into your home. So just being able to understand what what's required to have it, because sometimes um, it can be something as little or you could already even have the devices. Um, second one is to name two to three pieces of technology that could support independence. Um, and those will be kind of reviewed later on. And then the last one is just to identify resources for just further education or um, even resources to be able to look at to see what else is available and what else is out there. So those resources will go over um, on, our, on our last slide. So here is the basics for a smart home setup. So you need a centralized processor or um, we call the like basically your smartphone or a, um, a so like an Apple or an Android or you could have an iPad. You really just want something that you're going to be able to control with say a tap of a finger if you don't have um, the voice setup of Alexa. I'm going to also try and say that word a little bit quieter because I have multiple uh, Alexas in my home. So I want to make sure she's not going off in, my, in the background. Um, the second is you want to be able to have communication through these devices with um, different, they're called protocols, but that would be Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, and then Z-Wave and Zigbee are other common protocols. We'll go over those more in depth in a few slides. And then lastly, just knowing that each smart home can be customized based on what your ability is and be adjusted pending any neurological changes. So. If you're someone who doesn't need a voice activation, you can still use a and have a smart home and have it more at the touch of your finger from um, your iPad or your phone, something along those lines versus progressing to more um, of a auditory or voice controlled as um, any neurological changes happen. So then we kind of have our, our basics for communication. So there is um, high power and then there's low power. So when we initially think about device communication, typically with all of us think of Wi-Fi. And Wi-Fi is definitely the most common. And this is going to be a little bit more expensive and also slow down. So there, while Wi-Fi is definitely good for like especially like if you have a, a home with a few devices on it you want to also look into the potential of more low power device communication and that would be the two primary primary protocols are zigbee and z-wave think of them as just um almost like languages being able to for your devices to be able to talk to each other and so zigbee and z-wave are the two primary low power device communications and that may, makes it so that your um, network is not overwhelmed with uh, multiple um, devices on Wi-Fi, and it's almost kind of like below threshold. They're communicating below threshold um, throughout your home. 
so so far in order to like start a smart home you would need to see three three things your smartphone or a tablet a wi-fi and then typically they they that is a typical Wi-Fi strength that they recommend um, for a smart home. And then also the option for additional protocol communication. All right. And so I want to just go back. Let me go back one more slide. So when I say option for additional protocol communication, I think of, um, if you think of your smart home, every device has a different language. and the goal of these languages is to be able to communicate successfully um, with each other so that you can control all with, a, again, a tap of your finger or your voice. So these different protocols are almost like languages. And you want to have something that can, um, almost like an interpreter who can interpret all of these different languages. And so that is where a hub comes in. Hub is almost going to be like the quarterback of your smart home. The hub is going to be able to um, interpret, so to speak, different protocols so that you can control it with, again, tap of finger or with voice. So different hubs that ha are, don't have voice control um, are like the smart homes hub or the wink hub. Those are the two um, that have the most high, high rate, highly rated reviews. Um, and can work with the most um, protocols. And then you also have a vo ones with voice control. So um, Am Amazon's Alexa, Alexa Echo actually just um, came out last year with a new built-in hub for their um, Echoes. Before you just had the Echo and it was only using voice control and you had to have a hub separately. But now the Echo does have a hub built into it. And then also Google Home. So the only thing with and this is something that I, I recently had a, um, a conversation with a, another vendor who actually d goes into people's homes and um, installs these uh, smart homes for people. Um, and he was saying that with his experience, he really finds that having something with voice control, aka like an Alexa, and also having an additional hub is really helpful for a lot of patients who have a heavy smart home. When I say heavy, I mean a lot of devices. Because the Alexa, the Echo, really only communicates with Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, and Zigbee. Their Z-Wave is a like one of the other primary methods of communication from a protocol standpoint. And so if you don't have an additional external hub, like a Smart Things or a Wink, sometimes you're really limiting the devices that you can get based on the protocols that just the, the Echo does on its own. So like I kind of just reviewed, there's multiple different protocols. So the, there's 37 different brands and all of these brands have different protocols. And so all of them can communicate with Alexa so that you can control with your voice. The idea is with these different protocols, you can schedule things or create shortcuts or robots. So a schedule would be something that was preset and that you did not have to worry about giving any type of command. So for example, um, I have a Roomba in my home and I have created a schedule that every Tuesday and Thursday at 11 o'clock, my Roomba goes off and when I know that I'm not gonna, my husband and I are not gonna be home and my dog's not gonna be running around after it. So that's a schedule where you can schedule something within the app that is going to run automatically and you do not have to give it any type of trigger or command. Um, then you have something like shortcuts. Shortcuts would be where you are going to give it a trigger or a command, but you're going to be able to, that trigger or command can control multiple different things. For example, if you walked in the door and said, um, Alexa, I'm home, that could trigger multiple different things to happen. For example, it could um, adjust your thermostat to a, a, a level or a, um, a temperature that you find comfortable. It could turn on the downstairs lights. It could turn on your coffee maker. It could do multiple things with just that one single voice command. Um, and then also you can do something that are called, they're called robots. So this is almost like a shortcut, but robots are going to, can be triggered based on different, not only like voice commands, but any different input from one of your devices. So 
if you had, um, let's say, a um, a ring device, a, a like outdoor ring um, video device outside of your home, and it noticed um, that someone was coming up to your door, that could, could trigger a robot to happen where you're going to get a um, like a chime or something like that on your phone as well as just a notification. So there's different things like that you can also set up with your home. So now we're gonna kind of go over like where to start and what different um, things are available from a smart home setup right now. So these are six different categories that um, I found online through research that I kind of feel like pretty much every single device can fit into one of these categories. You have lighting, outlet, temperature, security, cameras, and home entertainment. And so the ones that I'm going to review right now, they interface with Wink, the Wink Hub, and Alexa together. So these ones that I'm going to review are all compatible with these two hub devices. So for your environmental control for lighting, you have like the Philips Hue starter kit, or you have the singlet um, LED starter kit below. So you can see the difference in price. So the, the Philips Hue is definitely a little bit more pricey. Um, but then you have the single LED lights. And I have noticed from, again, working with patients and having more and more people set up their homes, I personally have the Philips Smart Hue um, lights in my house. But I have heard great things about the other um, single um, LED starter kit as well. And it, again, from a price standpoint, it's definitely a much uh, better option for a, a cost. But what these are going to do is they can dim, they are, um, typically they are Wi-Fi enabled, um, but they're going to dim, they can be controlled with your, with your voice through Alexa, they can also be controlled with, through your app, um, and they just um, wire directly into any existing light fixture that you have. You don't have to worry about um, redoing any outlets, you don't have to worry about having a specific plug, these go directly into your existing light fixtures. And then they, they have little hubs on their own that you would plug directly into a router. And so that's how they're controlled via Wi-Fi. Then we have other um, additional things for temperature. So the Nest Learning Thermostat. Nest is, is great. It's definitely one of the more pricey ones. But the, the big thing with Nest is it's going to learn your routine. It's going to learn that when you get home at four o'clock, you'd like to have it set at 72. And so what will happen is as you use it um, and as you adjust it, it will start automatically adjusting for itself. Um, and then from a more a less expensive option, you also have the Emerson Sensi Wi-Fi enabled thermostat. That is another one that is um, less expensive, but can also work just as well. It just doesn't have the learning capabilities. And then um, up on the top, I have the Honeywell ceiling fan. And that is going to be, again, something that is Wi-Fi enabled, but you can also control with your voice. You're not having to worry about installing another outlet or installing a switch or something crazy like that. You definitely have to have someone install the fan. But having a fan that you can control pretty much with your voice for $114 is, is crazy that we have that now. So that, the Honeywell ceiling fan is, is the best option that I have found with my patients so far. And then the, in the bottom middle, we have like the smart blinds, the automation kit. So this smart blind automation kit is going to work with your existing blinds. It's not a new set of blinds. So it's going to work with your existing blinds. And you can, you basically, it's like, um, it's like a, a, a rigger setup where it is going to be controlled again with your voice. And that is going to, in turn, be able to, to pull your blinds up, open them, pull them down. Etc. I have not had a personally a lot of experience with this one, but this is what I have found from talking to other people in the smart home community as pretty much the best that's out there right now from a blind standpoint. And then we have more environmental control from a safety perspective. So as we just talked on the last slide about the Nest thermostat, there's also the Nest um, fire alarm and carbon monoxide alarm. What I really like about this is for my patients who are in wheelchairs, they, in their home, they aren't obviously able sometimes to get quickly around their home. So if something were to happen and an alarm went off, sometimes it's really hard to locate where those alarms actually are. 
the really nice thing about this nest fire and the carbon monoxide alarm is it will tell you exactly where it's sensing some type of smoke or carbon monoxide. So it will say um, fire or smoke detected in the kitchen or smoke detected in the upstairs bathroom. So it really gives um, just some, some verbal direction as to where things are. Then you also have the, um, the dome leak sensor and the dome water shutoff valve. So these two things I found after working with a patient who um, was a spinal cord injury and in his basement obviously is where his was water shutoff valve was. And he was having an issue with um, leaks in his basement. And obviously he did not have a, um, the ability to get down to his basement. He didn't have a stair glide or anything like that. So he would have to wait for someone to come and look and, and assess the, the damage. So I found these two because number one, it will, the shutoff valve, if it senses water via the, the leak sensor, you can subsequently control your water valve. You can shut your entire water off again with, with a voice command or a tap or the tap um, on your phone. So it was really nice for him to be able to at least minimize any damage until someone were, was, was to get and to help him and to look into his basement. So that's really cool. And he said, he's had a great success with that. Um, and then from a, another safety standpoint, I have the touchscreen deadbolt. So this is the, I'm, I wish I would have replaced this one with, it's the same exact um, product brand, but I have found that the one is, that is more of a, a latch versus a deadbolt is better for my patients who have limited dexterity. Um, if for some reason, God forbid, the power were to go out or something were to happen, we would still want patients to be able to, with limited dexterity, to be able to use gross motor function to open their door. Um, but what we really like about this is it's going to enable any patients to, let's say, give a caregiver a four-digit sequence to come into their home. And that four-digit digit sequence could change like every day or um, it could vary different um, via different caregiver. So it also gives you the ability to um, let people into your home, but also not with like it limited limits, giving them a key. So it's something that you can give them more of a virtual key and then dispose of that if they're no longer working for you or something like, or something happens. So that is um, the deadbolt. But like I said, I would, if I was looking into it, if I had limited dexterity, I would look for the one that's more of a latch. And then for in more environmental control from a technology standpoint, they are coming out with a ton of new TVs that are, are um, either Alexa enabled or voice enabled already. So um, there's, uh, from what I have heard, like the buzz around is there's going to be a ton of um, TV deals coming up um, on Black Friday, for, especially for these TVs on Amazon or Cyber Monday. Um, but these TVs basically will, like, will, um, communicate directly with your Alexa. You can, however, though, there is like a box that Amazon sells that's in the, uh, the Alexa family. You can um, purchase that. I want to say it's about $100. You can purchase that and hardwire that into your existing TV if you'd like. And then you'd be able to control that with, with your voice. And you can see right underneath it. So if you're shopping on Amazon, the thing you want to always look for is you want to make sure that at the bottom, um, I think it's in the bottom right hand corners when you're scrolling down the screen, it will have a, like a the little Alexa icon and it will tell you if it's certified to work with your device. So for example, this TV with my downstairs Echo that I have right now, if I were to purchase this TV with my existing um, Echo, I could control my TV by saying, Alexa, turn on my TV. So that's a really nice um, feature that Amazon has that I really would recommend people looking into um, if they're looking from a smart home stand up to make uh, from a smart home setup to make sure that your devices are interacting and will interact appropriately with what you currently have existing in your home. So additional environmental control stuff, like cooking, cleaning, more higher IADL activities. We have the Roomba. Um, and like I said, I have Roomba in my house um, and I really like it. It is the only thing that I, from a patient standpoint, that I've had challenges with is you still need to empty the basket of the Roomba. Um, they did just come out with one that is more, of course, more expensive, um, that it will automatically empty itself. 
Um, but that's just something, again, to look into if you have challenges reaching to the floor or you, if you have challenges from a dexterity standpoint, that may be something that um, you want to look into and make sure that you, can, you have the ability to do before purchasing because it is a, de a decent purchase. And then also the iRobot, the Brava Jet, that is a wet vac. So that is going to be more mopping versus the Roomba is more of a vacuum. And then on the upper right-hand corner, we have the Amazon Basics Microwave. So um, this is Amazon's initial kind of push for more um, Apple or appliance, um, appliance voice control. So this is the first one that they launched, which is their microwave. And like you can see, it's pretty inexpensive. It's $59. Um, but what I have heard is that it is extremely small. Um, so, but, and you would still have to open, actually like open the microwave, put something in it, and then you can enclose it. And then you can ask Alexa. So if you have the ability to have the gross motor skills to open, put something in and close it, and you're lacking more dexterity, this may be something that would be um, in your realm. And then at the bottom right hand or the bottom right hand corner, I have the smart plugs. So these are smart plugs that you can plug into any existing outlet and um, plug in any type of device into, whether it's your coffee maker or it's an existing light fixture that you don't want to get smart bulbs for. Um, but it's going to allow you to turn something on or off with your voice. It's not going to allow you to do anything specific. Um, so, for example, if you had a coffee maker um, and it was one of a drip coffee maker and you had everything set up, you would, and if, if you had um, one of the, uh, the mini plugs plugged into that, you could then just say, Alexa, turn my coffee maker on. But like I said, you, you would have to have it all set up beforehand. But Typically, we tell people from a smart home standpoint, if you want to just maybe get used to starting something um, with smart home, we recommend just trying getting an outlet, trying an outlet and trying it with one light and seeing how you do. So on top of the ability for Alexa to facilitate voice control in your home, it also has its own skills that you can use independently. So these were, there's a ton of different skills that Alexa has, um, and there were, they can, you can see that on the link at, on this um, slide that you can go to, but the top three that um, a lot of patients have found really helpful is, first, is it's a howl alert. So what it will do is, it's almost like a, a verbal life alert. Um, what's going to happen is you set it up in your Alexa app, and you designate certain a emergency contacts, or your pack, so to speak. So let's say you have a really reliable neighbor who um, has so they can help you when needed or if they would be willing to, if, God, if there was an emergency, come help you. You can put them on there. You can put your family, friends. Um, and what's going to happen is if something, let's say you were to have a fall or something were to happen where you needed immediate medical attention or you needed immediate um, like help from your family or someone like that, you could... Um, you would basically say, Alexa, alert, alert my path, or Alexa, alert the howl alert. And what, that's gonna, what that will do is it will send a text to all of your emergency contacts, as well as contact emergency services if, if help is required. So it's kind of like that virtual life alert. Then you have um, the tracker. So <laughs> this came about because I had a patient who um, it was very difficult for him to keep track of his phone. Um, and so when he didn't have his phone, and if for some reason he wanted to do something with more, um, more touch control of his smart home, um, he couldn't find his phone and he couldn't get it. So, and of course, it was all everyone's phone sometimes on silent. So what the tracker does, it, it allows you to find where your phone is with a ring, even if it's on silent. So let's say it's in the corner of your chair or it's um, in between pillows on your couch, it's going to um, alert your phone with a ring, even if it's on silent, so it makes it easier to find. And then on the, on the bottom, we have Lyft, so ride share. So Lyft is really powering trying to have more accessible options from a ride share standpoint. And um, what you can do is you can enable one of those skills and, and verbally give um, Alexa the command to order a Lyft to a flea market, flea market like where Amy is right now. Um, and you can also ask for a wheelchair accessible ride if that's what you need. So that, just knowing that those options are out there, I mean, there are hundreds and hundreds of Alexa skills that you can get into, um, but those are just um, a taste of what's available. 
And so this is additional um, technology, and I put um, SDI because I, was, I typically do this presentation with patients with spinal cord injuries, but this is anyone with any type of neurological um, deficit. So additional technologies that are available is first Apple accessibility, and Android also has their own accessibility options as well. Sometimes maybe a little bit better than Apple, but Apple with their most recent updates have really been pushing um, more accessible features for their iPhones, their iPads, et cetera. Um, and you can find that by going to your settings, general accessibility, and then it's going to list different accessibility options based on any area of deficit, whether it's vision, motor, um, uh, all like hearing or auditory, and you can um, look into those by the, the other link that I have right under the Apple accessibility on this page. The one that I'm showing in that picture um, is basically for patients who maybe lack, lack um, like I said, fine motor control or any, any motor control typically. Um, but this is basically going to, it's a little box you can see that kind of hovers around their app and um, it will jump. And then you can use it with a switch on your wheelchair or a head control or a sip and puff. And you can select um, a different app when, it when that square jumps over, over the app that you need to. So yes, it's, it's not gonna be as quick as being able to touch it, but at least it gives patients with, let's say, no hand function or minimal hand function, the ability to operate their phones independently. Um, and so then the next one is like the Tecla multi-device control. This is primarily made for, for patients who have limited upper extremity function um, and they are typically controlling things with um, a head array or um, a sip and puff or um, switches. But this is a, a multi-device control apparatus that is set on the back of a, a power wheelchair and it integrates with a power wheelchair. Um, and it allows you to control multiple devices, whether that's your phone, your laptop, your iPad, et cetera, with, um, it's almost kind of like a hub for those devices. Um, but like I said, you could, I could go on for hours about this one, but there is an awesome YouTube channel that I, I put right there for if anyone is more interested in that. And then the last one here is the glass house head, head control. So if they kind of morph it together, glasses and mouth. So um, the glass house is, again, made for patients with no upper extremity control. Um, or motor function, and you put that on your on your face just like glasses, and then you can see the little bite stick is used for um, like to click and drag things. So it's Bluetooth enabled, um, and so it's going to Bluetooth with any of your devices. And as you move your head, it's going to move your mouth, and then you're going to be able to use the bite stick to be able to click and drag stuff. Um, and uh, there's also a video there as well that I, I put in as a hyperlink that you can take a look. It's really extremely interesting. Um, and I think that um, different uh, outpatient rehabilitation centers do have these. I know like McGee Hospital um, in Philadelphia has one, has one for patients to trial as well. And so smart home technology, where to go from here? So this is was my last objective that I wanted to give you guys like any additional resources to further any understanding of smart home technology or devices or um, kind of just to, to see kind of what, what's out there and what's available. So these are all different um, websites that I found that I got a lot of my information from. And I, when I started looking into smart homes, I really looked, I, I relied heavily on these, these websites. Um, so we'll, I, this will be available for you. And I, really feel like a lot of the, from a smart home standpoint, a lot of the, the learning that I found um, easiest for me was really taking a look at what current people have in their homes. So there's a lot of Facebook groups. I know you guys are all involved in the Facebook group. Um, there's a ton of different things for smart homes on YouTube as well. I would really encourage you if you're interested in it to just go on YouTube and kind of see what you can find. And that's really where I feel like a lot of the hidden gems are. Um, but these are a bunch of different um, websites that I, like I said, I heavily relied on. Um, and so hopefully that can really help anyone who's looking to start a more of a smart home for their home. All right, and that is it. So I'll leave this last page up. Um, let me see. But does anyone have any questions?
So I've unmuted everyone. And um, are there any questions for Rebecca? Hi, this is Jim. Yeah, sometimes he's alive. Oh, hi, hi Jim. Hi. Uh, have you came, come across any, I guess, reasonably priced devices that would open doors? Yes. Actually, I researched yes, I some. They're kind of exp they're kind of expensive. I researched some of them. So let me. I'm sorry. I'm like sitting here by paging through all my stuff. So um, <laughs> the yes, they are definitely expensive. I the the one that I have found that's most reliable because that is Jim. I will tell you, like that is the mm -hmm. one of the biggest concerns that I have just as a, as a clinician. Obviously, is like patient safety, right? And and yeah, of course, exactly you guys right, yeah. do. You know, so um. I, that, is, that is the biggest thing when looking at any smart home devices at all is I will research a ton on customer reviews um, because I feel like there, so many people will promote things that um, maybe like, and like maybe they haven't trialed with someone with any type of disability. And so that's where I feel like you're really going to get the best from those customer reviews. But the one that I have found um, is that was most reliable is about two thousand dollars, and was that okay. kind of along the, the same lines as what you were you were finding? Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, yes. But um, that's I mean, if I find anything, I will definitely forward you guys like any more information. But that's that's, mm -hmm. that's the one I found that's most reliable. Um, but and and the quote unquote I think heavy quotes cheapest of the most reliable. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Sorry. Okay, thank you. Okay. <clears throat> Hi, Rebecca, this is Tara. I have a question about the Zigbee and the Z-Wave. Yeah, I, I'm not. I know, it's kind of how confusing. The, how do those work? Uh, do they have to work with the, I don't want to say her name because she's around, with the A <laughs> device from Amazon? So, no, they do not have to. Um, so, basically, Zigbee and Z-Wave are, I'm trying to think, it's almost like, um, they're kind of like Bluetooth. Um, in terms of it is, oh, and they create what's called like a mesh network. So you know how in, in your homes with your Wi-Fi, you know how sometimes when you get further and further away from your router, your Wi-Fi gets like a little bit slower and not as strong. So yeah. the idea with Zigbee and Z-Wave is they create this mesh network. So let's say, um, let's say your, uh, let's say, I'm trying to think, like, so for example, I live in like a, uh, a small row home, but I have like lovely plaster walls. <laughs> so um, it creates like a little bit of a challenge when it comes to my Wi-Fi because it just, it doesn't, it doesn't um, like impact all like through, throughout my house. So I have to get like a Wi-Fi booster. So what, what Zigbee and Z-Wave do is let's say on like my, if you're downstairs floor, you had a, um, a plug that was a, a Zigbee or a Z-Wave protocol that's going to communicate then again with uh, the plug in the kitchen that also has, has Zigbee and Z-Wave. And so it creates a stronger, um, like a stronger power, so to speak. So it's almost like, um, like the people holding hands so that that way you, you still have the same amount of power of Zigbee or Z-Wave um, with that, with that mesh network. But basically it's, it's communication between the, between the devices, but it's just, it's more low powered. Um, does that, does that make sense? Yeah. I know it's kind of, but, it is kind um, of confusing. So the Amazon, uh, A, again, I don't want to say her name. You're good. You're good. She can work independently from yep, Z Wave. Yep. Okay. So, so the current, um, the current echo that is out now. Um, and also um, the show, the Amazon show, because um, like, mm -hmm. for example, I have the Echo. If I were to go back, I would 100% get the, get the show. I really like the show and what Amazon is, is coming out with. They have like two different show devices. Um, one that is a little bit more expensive, I think 200 plus, and then one I think they're marketing at like $100 right now. But um, yes, yeah, they can work totally independently and they can communicate with Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, as well as I want to say, I want to say Zigbee. I, they, they leave out one of the two, um, but that that will be something that when you are looking to purchase smart home products, in the description, it will it should tell you what protocol they run on, 
and you just want to make sure that you're you're getting a device that can run with the protocol that Alexa has on her own. Thank you. Yeah, if anyone course. have questions, please ask or type in your questions in the uh, chat box. Then we can ask Rebecca. Mm -hmm. And like I said, I can also, I mean, I know you guys have a Facebook too, but if there's questions after the fact, Amy can always like email me and I can try and email back with, with any answers too. Because I know sometimes it's like a lot to process <laughs> and a lot to think about. Right. Yeah. Um, is there, I know this is out of the presentation uh, scope, is there anything that could communicate with the car? So in terms of to do what? Like um, maybe from the car you could open your door, but the, the, the oh, yeah. device so, to open the door. Yep. Yes, you can. So again, Amazon is killing it right now. They just came out with, um, I think they partnered with, I want to say like, is it Chevy or something? Um, they, they have partnered with different car dealerships that, that actually integrate Alexa in the Alexa, um, um, in the cars themselves, right? Um, some of them have mm -hmm. that right now, but there is also like an external um, device that you can get and plug into your car. Yeah. And so you'd be able to control from there. But you could also do it from your phone as well. Like if you were like sitting in the, obviously don't text and drive, but if you were sitting in the, in the driveway, right, you could also do it, do that through your phone if needed. Okay. So to clarify, we're talking about opening the car door? The, or the house the, door? I thought you were talking about opening, I thought you were talking about opening the house door. Yes, yeah, yeah, like the front door of the house, yeah. So there's nothing to open a car door, but the front door of the house, yeah, yep. You could do that through your phone, or if you had that, um, the Alexa-enabled device in your car, you could do that as well, if you were, like, sitting in the driveway getting ready to get out. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. um, Mona joined us. Hello, Mona. Mona. Hi. Asking, <laughs> Mona's asking if we'll publish the slides on on the website or in Facebook. I think that Amy, Amy, we're recording this, right? So I think, what did you, did you want to maybe post that on the Facebook page? Yeah, we'll post on the Facebook page that we are recording this presentation for everyone to, who has missed it. Okay, that's even better. Thank you. When, when you talked about the smart home hubs, do they have both the Zigbee and the other uh, Z-Wave protocol? Yep, they do. Yeah. Yep. Okay. And so the, the big thing about the hub is, they, so as you start to create a smart home, you will notice that you're going to have to download a ton of apps. Every smart home device typically has an app with it, right? And so the thing that's nice is, with with either the Alexa app or one of the hub apps, you can then control all of those apps in one. So it's it's nice that if you were to do more of like a touch control of your home, you could do that through a single, like I said, it's kind of like that quarterback. You can do it through like a single app versus being like, oh shoot, where's my cue app for my lights? Or where is um, my, Oh shoot, like my, my Roomba app for my, my Roomba. So that's what's also really nice about it as well is that it, it controls it under that one single single application on whether it's your iPhone or, or iPad or Android. And then uh, another question. Uh, yeah. If there's multiple people in the house, can multiple people use the hub at the, like, at the same time yep yep so that okay. is one thing that of course i mean if you're if you're living with other people right this if you're going to start to do something with smart home it really is a full it's like a, a full family affair so 
everyone has to learn um, the the language, so to speak, um, because there's like like for example, I was setting up. Um, of course, like last Christmas, all my whole, my whole family got smart home stuff because I was just like in a total a total kick with smart home, um, and I was trying to set up my mother and father in law's lights, and they both had a disagreement as to what they wanted to call the light. So my mother in law called it the reading light, and my father in law wanted to call it like the downstairs light or something like that. But everyone, mm-hmm. like, there has to be a single name for it because. Alexa is only going to recognize one name for, for that device. So that's what I mean in terms of everyone kind of has to be on the same page of, all right, the downstairs lights are here, here, and here, or the bedroom reading lamp is this light. So some, sometimes there can be a little bit of a learning curve with that. I would recommend like maybe just printing something out and having everything, um, like everything just on like a printout. If, like, if it's hard to remember different devices and, and what exactly you call them. It will also be like in your app as well. But if you have, um, let's say, a home with with like kiddos in it as well, you know, like it's sometimes hard for kids to remember exactly what things are called. Um, or if you have a caregiver who's coming in as well, sometimes having like just like something laminated saying here's what everything is called, um, because then it allows them to also use it effectively too. Well, I, I really like, this is Tara, I really like that I could um, buy the mini plugs and start, you know, trying it that yeah. way. The smart exactly, mini- start from there. Yep. Yeah. And that's where, like, uh, you, I, I'm now well versed in the smart home thing. <laughs> I know. And, and that's, it, it, it definitely can be very intimidating for people who are not, um, crazy technology savvy I mean I'll tell you this like I, I feel like I'm pretty tech savvy and sometimes I'm like I want to throw the phone against the wall sometimes right but it is when it works and it, it typically does work really well it is so incredible what it can do from an independent standpoint so but yeah just kind of like, like get your feet wet with it just maybe get like the little the little plugs um and you can even get if you if you don't want to go um all in and get a, a show or something like that um very I want to say um what is it I like I think the one of the the echoes is they they like made a a um a less expensive echo that also has like that little bit of that hub feature in it as well I want to say it's like a hundred and seventy dollars um you could even start with something just just like that you know um and then you'd be able to like, and start with like just a light or something and go from there. Yeah. And so uh, this is Tara again. I'm, I'm, I'm yep. learning a lot. Um, with the Howl Alert, you could go into the Echo app and set up um, the people's name you want to alert if there is an emergency in your home. Or yep, your emergency contact. Like that. Yep, yep, you can do it. Yep, you do it right in in your your um, Alexa app. Yep. Uh, and another thing too, I will say this is not really smart home related, but um, if someone if you have an iPhone, the the medical ID that's on the iPhone as well is also really helpful. Um, I. I do encourage a lot of my patients to get the Apple Watch if they are um, a major falls risk or if they live alone or um, if they, and of course, if they, if they have the means because it's not, it's, not um, it's not the least expensive thing in the world. So, um, but um, with the medical ID, it's kind of the same idea as, as the Howl, but if you were, let's say, in, in the community and some, God forbid something were to happen, um, the like, emergency first responders are now being trained to look into patients or, or an individual's phone for their medical ID information. And so what that will, what you can load on there is any past medical histories, allergies, medications, um, uh, emergency contact individuals, um, physicians, you can have all of that stuff loaded on there. If God forbid you were um, not, at, you, you didn't have the ability to give any verbal direction of those, of those things. But that's something you could do today, um, and it's through your medical ID on your health app in on your on your iPhone. Okay. 
can emergency personnel get to it, though, if you have a passcode? So if you are, so even if it's locked, if you, um, I'm, I'm going to do it on my phone. Of course, I can't do it on my phone. If your phone is locked and you put, you know, when you put in the wrong password and you, but you hold in like to turn almost to turn off your phone, it's either you can slide the power off or you slide for um, emer like emergency, emergency services or something like that or medical ID. So yes, you can get into it even if it's, it's locked. Yeah. It will only let you get into that, that um, medical ID for um, EMS services or something like that. Good to know. Yeah, it, it, it is really amazing. And then same thing with the Apple Watch. If you press and hold on um, the circle button on the right side, it will say either like shut off or it will say medical ID. And if you swipe for the medical ID, it will show you um, that will come to the, to the service. That's good. Yeah. Well, thank you guys. I really appreciate you listening. I, I, I hate babbling on like this. So again, if there's any, if there's any, I, I always feel bad when it's just my voice. Um, if you guys have any questions or anything, Amy, you can always feel free to forward them to me and I can try and answer them as best as I can. Sure. Absolutely. Well, thank you, Becky, for yeah, giving us the presentation. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Thank you. Rebecca, thank you. On, on behalf of the Neuromuscular Disease Foundation, we all thank you and our patients who have joined us today. We thank you for this presentation and we of course, will you're welcome. post the recording. And, uh, yes, and like I said, questions? please let me know if you have any questions. Yeah. Any other questions, Amy, could forward them to you and that's exactly. sweet. Yes, absolutely. All right. All right, well, guys, I hope you have a great rest of your day, whether it's the morning, afternoon, wherever you are. So um, have a good weekend. And, yeah, like, like I said, I would just maybe just start to dabble a little bit and just see what, see what you can find and, and let me know if you have any questions. Great. Thank you. Thank you very right, much. Have a good one. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Mona, and everyone for joining us.